Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you from wherever in the world you are joining us from. My name is Leanne Gonzalez. I'm a technical officer at WHO's Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research based in Geneva, Switzerland, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate as we start to actually have a special video welcome from the newly appointed UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, Dr. Tlaleng Mufuking. Dr. T, as she's known to many, is also a commissioner at the Commission for Gender Equality and a medical doctor and sexual and reproductive health and rights expert in South Africa. She is also the author of Dr. T, A Guide to Sexual Health and Pleasure. She was unfortunately unable to be with us in person today, but heard about the launch and the panel and wanted to send her video greetings to you all. So without any further ado, I will turn things over to Dr. T to get us started. My name is Dr. Tlaleng Mufugeng, and I'm the United Nations Special Repertoire on the Right to Health. It is my pleasure to be able to welcome you today to this global launch of the interagency framework and guidance on planning, designing, and implementing of digital health interventions with and for young people. The framework launched today by WHO, UNICEF, UNESCO, and UNFPA could not have come at a more opportune time. 10 months into the COVID-19 global pandemic, the landscape in which all of us access health information and services has drastically changed. Digital health interventions have helped to ensure continuity of health information and services. For the 1.8 billion young people between ages 10 to 24 worldwide, health challenges are not new. Before the pandemic, many adolescents and young people still struggled to access health information and services to which they are entitled. For this reason, digital health interventions have long been appreciated for their ability to bridge barriers to information and services for young people, particularly on issues around mental health, sexual and reproductive health rights. Digital technology in general has also afforded agency to young people themselves. I remember being a young medical student who had access to a mobile phone and data, and that's how my journey started as a peer educator and later on as a sexual health doctor. Young people have observed and identified gaps in health information and services. Adolescents and young people have driven change. As content creators, web and app programmers, intervention developers, and social media influencers. This guidance provides important information and resources to developers, implementers, researchers, as well as donors. It also emphasizes the importance of meaningful youth participation. And throughout the intervention and development process, and provides a series of case studies and tips for making any engagement authentic and sincere. The panel today will focus on this meaningful youth engagement. And I thank you for joining this important discussion. Our sincere thanks to Dr. T for sending us this video welcome and for setting the stage for today's webinar. So now I wanna turn it over all, to all of you who are attending today. I'm gonna to ask our IBP colleagues to please launch our first poll question, if they could. We want to know from you, what would you say best describes your role in the digital for youth space? I'm gonna ask our colleagues to keep it open for another 10 seconds or so while people get a chance to answer. And while they're doing that, I'm gonna go through um, our webinar objectives and some basic housekeeping uh, matters. So today we want to cover in the next 55 minutes, two things. We want to provide you with an overview of the newly launched framework and guidance coming from WHO, UNFPA, UNICEF, and UNESCO. And then we wanna spend some time sharing and discussing case studies of what meaningful youth engagement looks like in practice. If at any stage during this panel, there are questions that you would like to pose to someone who's been speaking, um, 
please put those in the Q&A, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. The chat is for you to use, um, to communicate with each other and with us, to share your experiences, share reflections that you might be having based on what you're hearing, or just to say hello. Um, I'm gonna take a look at what the poll results are at the moment. It looks like we have quite a lot of implementers, researchers, some content creators and funders, and uh, about 18% of our 100 respondents do something else entirely. So I think we have a really lovely mix of people here who probably have some experience in this area um, and who um, have lots to share. So again, questions for the panel, put those in the Q&A and please let's have a rich discussion in the chat. That is the only thing I have to say with regards to uh, housekeeping, so let's get moving. I'm next going to turn things over to a colleague of mine at WHO. Brianna Lucido also works in the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research, and she has been absolutely integral in moving us through this guidance's development. So I am delighted that she will be introducing you all today to the framework and guidance. Brianna, over to you. Thanks so much, Leanne. Hi, everyone. It's, I'm so delighted to be with all of you today. WHO and our partners have started developing this guidance over a year ago, which makes today an extremely special day and because we get the opportunity to share this with all of you. I think everyone can agree that there is a lot of excitement around digital technologies, new social media platforms, and innovative ways to generate content and reach young people. As this energy and enthusiasm continues to grow, we recognize the importance of understanding insights from the field and from research on the first generation of these interventions in order to help build effective solutions with and for young people for the current and future eras. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through the guidance and briefly familiarize you with its contents. The guidance and the framework that's presented on the slide grew out of a multi-step process that included a targeted literature review, consultations, interviews, a global workshop, and additional input from experts and young people. In total, nearly 100 people provided input. So for those of you who are on the webinar today and were alongside us for this journey, we really thank you for all your inputs. What you see on the slide, the framework is an illustration of the process for designing youth-centered digital health interventions. For those of you who, are, who work in this space, these steps probably look really familiar. But what sets this apart from other documents and resources is that it uniquely is focused on youth-centered interventions, which is described in more detail in the guidance itself. This process serves as the foundation for the guidance and the organiz organizational structure for the document. The main areas of the framework serve as separate chapters, which provide additional detail on that area. There are two chapters which explain the three fundamental principles and the four cross-cutting actions that apply to all three main stages of the framework. And following these three are three chapters on each of the main stages of the process, planning, developing, and implementing. In addition, there is a separate section just for donors, which distills information on donor experiences and tips for funding youth-centered digital health interventions. And there is a section which provides perspectives from young people on the do's and don'ts on youth engagement. Visually, this is a snapshot of one of the sections of the document, specifically the carry out a phased launch section within the implementing chapter. Each section of the guidance is really short, between three and five pages in length. And as you can see on the screen, this section is only two pages. This was purposefully done in order to make sure that this was a user-friendly resource for, our, for readers. And each section follows a very similar content structure, starting with an overview of that step and brief definitions, moving to current practices, showcasing key tips and warnings, 
or points that readers should be aware of when doing this step. And there's a list of additional resources at the end of each section, which provide further explanation or insight on how to carry out that specific step. Additionally, within each section and sprinkled throughout the guidance, there are case studies which demonstrate how each idea um, within the section have been put into practice. So the purpose of this document is to help health intervention designers, developers, implementers, researchers, and funders thoughtfully plan, develop, and implement effective youth-centered digital health interventions. So for those of you who are new to this space, this guidance should serve as a start to finish quick read for how to sustainably and responsibly develop these types of interventions. And for those of you who are not new to this space, this document can serve as a repository of resources that you can reference at whatever stage that you're at in the process. So hopefully this quick sneak preview into the document whets your appetite for a little bit more. And we encourage everyone to go and download and use the guidance. It's now available on the WHO website and can be accessed using the QR code on the slide. I wanna once again thank everybody who is attending the webinar today and for everybody who has been with us along this ride because it's been a great one and we really appreciate all your help in this. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Leanne. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Um, that was a succinct overview. And so there's nothing more for everyone else to do who's on the webinar right now, except to go and access the document yourself um, and take a look around. And again, our thanks to everyone who's been involved um, and, our four, and our three sister agencies as well. Uh, so at this stage, we're gonna transition to our panel, but I wanna do this by starting off with our second poll question to all of you in attendance. Our segue, so I'll ask our IBP colleagues to uh, pull up the second poll for everyone. So we're segueing to meaningful youth engagement right now. So how well do you understand this concept? Go ahead and give us an answer there and I'll ask our colleagues to maybe end the polling in about 10, 15 seconds so people can see it. We've opted to focus on this for our panel because when it comes to the concept of youth engagement, we think that there are a lot of folks who work in the area of adolescent and youth health who understand that it needs to happen and understand it can't be tokenistic. But when it comes to trying to put meaningful youth engagement as a concept, as an idea into practice, it can be tough to do. It can be tough to visualize how how that can carry forth across the development cycle of an, a digital health intervention or any intervention for that matter. So what we're going to do is um, through a series of lightning talks, I'm gonna ask our next speakers to share examples from their own work, um, or so examples from their own work that pertain to a particular point in the digital health intervention development process where we can really see youth engagement look come alive and hopefully we can have a good discussion from there. And so I think um, we should be able to see the results to see what you, the attendees, know about meaningful youth engagement. So I love that we have some people who are brand new to this and I think they should be able to walk away with some good ideas. And we have a lot of us who I think, you know, about 40% have some basic knowledge, 33% say they have a, a solid background and we have about 10% of us who really feel like they're experts. So again, engage in the chat, let us know what you think and don't be afraid to pose some questions to our panelists. That is enough from me at this stage. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Christopher Walker. Uh, Chris lives by the motto, people helping people. He is a project coordinator at ETR and is currently finishing his master's in public health at the University of Texas Health Science Center. With a sexual and reproductive health background, he is a firm believer in sexual justice and empowering all people to take control of their sexual health. Uh, Chris, I'm delighted to hear what you've got for us, so over to you. Good morning, evening, and afternoon, world. My name is Christopher Walker, and, I, and I'm here representing YTH, Youth Tech Health and Initiative ETR, Education Training and Research, and I'm going to share with you how us at ETR do effective and impactful youth engagement through a three-tier process that I like to call discovery, innovation, and leadership. Let's go for the ride. Next slide. 
So ETR stands for Education, Training, and Research. And we are an amazing nonprofit based out of Scotts Valley, California, that has an expertise over three content areas, I mean, four content areas, sexual reproductive health, equity through STEM, alcohol, tobacco, and drug use, and school-based education. And one thing that's unique to ETR is that we do it, we have the capacity to do everything in-house from intervention creation to research to evaluation to product dissemination and research dissemination on all platforms. And we are able to do this through something that we like to call our health equity framework, where we acknowledge the social backgrounds, people's psychological influences, the power dynamics in their lives, and the things that people go through holistically as we advance health equity. Um, through using diversity and inclusion, we put everything forward to really get people the resources, access, and education that they need to live and sustain healthy and better lives. Next slide. So I'm gonna start out with the discovery by sharing my story. So about a year and a half ago, um, I saw a micro funding opportunity for youth innovators to come up with uh, projects um, that advance the conversation about HIV within their communities. And to make a long story short, I sent a proposal in and I was accepted. And I was so shocked and I was so amazed that they wanted me because it's amazing for you to want to feel a part because often more than not, youth get a seat at the table, but we never have the opportunity to be heard. But ETR took it a step forward because they said, hey, Chris, I see you, I want you, but we're gonna give you an additional opportunity and we're gonna allow you to lead this project. So not only was I a grantee during the process, I applied for the role as a project coordinator and I had the opportunity to oversee the role. So when I talk about discovery, ETR gave me the opportunity to really set myself up as a public health leader by discovering me, by viewing me as a community Acts, asset and enabling to work in partnership with me to advance health and wellness for the communities that I presently work with. Next slide. So now we're going to talk about innovation. Um, when it comes to youth engagement at YTH, there's this model that we go by called trauma-informed youth-centered design. That's a mix of trauma-informed care, um, human-centered design, and youth professional development. And so through this process, we acknowledge that youth trauma through a healing-centered approach focus on equity, safety, empowerment, resilience, and relationship building. We involve and engage youth as partners and respect their knowledge, strength, and leadership. And we also design, iterate, and share solutions that meet the needs of youth and reflect their experiences. So we're looking at youth holistically and not what they can offer. We look at, the, we look at them as beings that can help push the work forward, acknowledging that there can nothing be for them without them. Next slide. And this is made possible through our YTH Youth Advisory Board. So this panel of beautiful people, they give us insight on everything that we do when it comes to innovation development, when it comes to project insights, when it comes to dissemination of data, when it comes to products. We lead the forefront of the field because we go to them first. We acknowledge that we have to have them a part of every process because we cannot leave youth out. When we're creating things for youth, it needs to be for youth and by youth, and they need to be held at the center. We need to be centered around youth and centered around this population because it's needed. Because out their input, we tend to make things that are not going to be beneficial and not engaging to them. So the way to combat that is that you get them in from the start, but also you don't tokenize them, you give them re the respect, you make them feel value, and you make them feel a part of the team. Next slide, please. And so we, as we began to form out what youth engagement looked like, we, were, we started to have discussions with youth leaders. We talked to our CAB, we talked to people who attended our conferences to figure out how youth define youth engagement. Because all too often we have adults defining engagement and how can we define something that we're not a part of? So we chose to ask youth. And they told us that youth engagement is trust, it is access and transparency, accountability, authority and responsibility, respect, empathy and a non-judgmental mindset. So if you're out there and you want to work with youth or if you're working with youth, make sure you have these attributes at the forefront of your connections and your engagements because you wanna make sure that youth feel a part of the process and make sure that they're holistically sound with whatever you're doing and putting forward. Next slide. This is what I like to call a youth engagement starter pack, okay? If you're looking to work with youth, I want to work with youth. The first thing that you need to have is money. No longer can we tokenize youth and just say, hey, I want you in for a focus group and I want your opinion and I'm not going to give you any type of incentive. We have to be willing and ready and available to incentivize youth because that's what keeps them engaged. Pay us like you want to get paid. We want to get paid as well for our input because we are expertise based off life and lived experiences. Make sure, and then you have to also make sure you're training staff on competent youth engagement, making sure that your staff is prepared and they have their culture, they have enough cultural humility to really deal with you 
youth and see what they're going through and view them holistically. You need to integrate into the agency program strategy. So have youth in from the beginning. Don't add youth at the later part of implementation or evaluation. Make sure you seek insights from youth at the forefront to make sure that you have a stable progression and to make sure you have a domino effect throughout the process because youth, if it's ending with youth, it needs to start with youth. And then you manage youth advisors as you would manage other expert stakeholders. We have stakeholders and we pay them based off their experience. Even though youth are younger than your normal typical inducts, we need to respect their experiences because these people are stakeholders and the experiences is what we need to move forward. And we wanna make sure that we give them the respect and make sure that they feel the value and make sure that if we're giving them that seat at the table, they feel it like, like they belong in that seat. All too often we get these seats and we feel like that we don't belong. And the way that we feel like we belong is that you treat us that we belong. Next slide. And so every year, um, YTH has a conference called YTH Live. And so during this conference, we discuss everything from climate change to sexual reproductive health issues to what's going on in the world at the times from a youth perspective. Using the CAB and a, and a multitude of resources, we bring organizations across the world together to really discuss and talk about issues that affect youth. It's youth-led and youth-centered, and it's amazing. And this is an open invitation to you to join us next year, October 4th through the 6th, at our next YTH Live virtual tech conference. You can find out more details on YTH .org. We just announced these dates. There's going to be more coming soon. Um, and if you want to connect with me, once again, my name is Christopher Walker. Um, I am a project coordinator at ETR. My direct email is a chris.walker at etr.org. And be sure to follow us on all handles. At, um, you can follow us at etr.org. Go to our website, etr.org, or follow us on Facebook at www.pacesby.com slash YTH. Um, follow us on Instagram at YTHORG, or follow us on our uh, ETR Instagram page. Thank you so much. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, make sure you hit them in the chat box below or ask me at the Q&A. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Chris. You did everything in those five-ish minutes. That was fantastic. So we had a great example of how an organization like ETR has really embraced um, the concept of meaningful youth engagement, not just in the programming they do, but also in how they operate themselves. And then I loved that, um, that sort of package of what you need if you want to have meaningful youth engagement. So thank you. Let's go straight to our next speaker. Uh, Mala Tabit is the founder of Indola 360, a mobile app designed to provide honest and judgment-free sexuality education and services to young people across Cameroon and Sub-Saharan Africa. She's currently the Senior Technical Advisor for Comprehensive Service Delivery at IPPF Africa Region, and was formerly in charge of youth engagement at the She Decides Support Unit in London. London, sorry. Mala, over to you. Thank you very much, Brianna. Uh, sorry, Leanne. <laughs> and um, I'm here thinking about how I'm going to match Chris's energy. That was just amazing. And I'm feeling a bit incompetent here. So thank you so much, Chris, for sharing uh, and for the energy this morning. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about prototyping. So um, I'm really excited. And I was very excited when I was um, called on to join uh, the panel today. Um, based on the work that we've done in the past. And FYI, um, this was quite a few years back when I, I could still consider myself a young person. Um, unfortunately, things happened and I got older, but um, you know, it's life, we move on. And the picture you see here um, is a picture of my friend, Edith. Um, and this uh, speaks to the nature of how we started. So we used to run a national peer-to-peer uh, -peer se sexuality education program in Cameroon. And we work um, a lot with adolescents and young people. And as part of those conversations, young people would say, you know, we want something a bit more anonymous. Can you um, present us something that still helps us get the message across, but with a lot less embarrassing stories to share, etc." And so that is where the idea of Ndolo 360 was born. It was born to conquer um, a lot of the fears that young people have about sexuality and even fears about accessing this information in, a, in an open and honest and judgment-free way. And so my friend here, uh, we called her up one day and she said, and, and I said, can you um, be part of a photo shoot? We want to do some ads for, for the app and she, and she showed up. So there you go, uh, that's edit for you. And so in the start, when we started having these conversations about 
um, how do we make the app as useful, um, a tool that can really authentically inform uh, young people's choices, but also be informed um, by their needs and their preoccupations. And so we came up with a prototype. And this prototype, we were so excited. We wanted to do everything. We wanted to write everything. We wanted to inform. We wanted to present the majority of information that young people would find useful. And so we took this first piece of information back to young people. And we said, what do you think? Uh, do you like this? Uh, what do you think about the features? What do you think about the content? And we got a lot of amazing feedback. So they said, oh, you know, we love it, it's great, but it does feel like a textbook. Um, there's a lot going on here. I can't figure out what I want. Um, actually, I don't like this. Um, I like this, I don't like that. In terms of aesthetics, I prefer it look this way. Can you reposition? So there's a lot of feedback in, the, in this process of getting, uh, um, re refining our prototype. And um, so we had to go back to the drawing board. And so the next slide, um, sorry, next slide. So the next slide is what it looks like. Um, no, the previous one. Yes, the previous, uh, yes, this slide. This is what the, the final product looked like after we had that initial conversation with young people. And so we had to reposition and re-prioritize uh, uh, content, features, et cetera, based on feedback coming directly from young people. And so um, this slide and the rest, I'm just going to be explaining um, just some of the key features and how young people have been responding to, to it so far. And so when young people walk in, uh, you have an information bank. Initially, it didn't look this way. Initially, there were like, I don't know, 15 different features, which was just really confusing. And so when we went back to the drawing board, we had to reposition these into a maximum of, I think, eight uh, features, um, which then uh, gives you an opportunity to dive in deeper when you, when you, when you click in. Um, next slide. Um, so yes, like I said, um, the next couple of slides will just give you a glimpse into what the, the, the rest of the features look like. One of them was young people said we want to have fun. Okay, so we wanted to, of course, we wanted um, our content to be verified um, and true content. Um, so we did inform it uh, from UNFPA's operational guidelines for, for CSC. We also used the UNESCO technical guidelines. We used up-to-date and verified information. But young people said, we want this to be presented in a way that looks, that is fun and that I actually want to go back to. And so uh, one of the um, features that we fine-tuned here was the games and quizzes where uh, you can learn, get some more knowledge while having fun. And this is one, this is one of, the, of the, this is just a quick slide, um, a screenshot out of, out of the app that shows uh, young people various different questions and you can answer and gain points as you go. Next slide, please. Ask a sex part. This was our most requested uh, feature on the app and young people had a chance. I say had and, and, I, and, I, and I will explain that in the end why I keep speaking in the past tense. Um, and the ask a sexpert feature was a platform for young people to uh, send questions to a sexual health expert and get a response within minutes. And so uh, this was our hottest feature and young people would, you know, bombard us with so many questions um, about, about their sexual reproductive health and rights. And this personally was what really uh, kept me connected because I think I feel like this was the bottom line of our work. And right there on the, right, on the left is um, a quote from a father um, who emailed us to say that, um, he really appreciated this app and it's helped him and his kids uh, have an initial conversation about uh, sexual health. Next slide, please. Um, this again is around uh, what we call the sectionary. So we're trying to keep things as fun as possible. And so a sectionary is a sexual health dictionary, um, which contains uh, a database of different words or phrases or quest of, you know, just different terms that have to do with sex or sexual health or sexuality education and with uh, descriptions of what they are. Um, yep, next slide. 
and yes, that's it. So um, we are really excited that in the end, we were able to provide a really strong uh, tool that was user friendly, that was especially fun to use, did not feel like a textbook. But then again, um, because like I explained in the, at the start, this was just a group of friends who were just really excited about uh, passionate about sexual and reproductive health and wanted to do something and so we worked on our own we use our personal funds to do all of this and when the funds dried up Dolo 360 closed because the back end is um, I don't know for some of you who work on uh, digital health you'd know what a back end looks like for for such an app and you know when people have to keep asking questions it was just really expensive to run and we had to close it down but thankfully the the app is still there it's static uh, but the, the more interactive features are not, are not uh, functional anymore. But yeah, this was a very good uh, opportunity for us to contribute in, in our own way and in my own way personally to improving adolescents and youth uh, sex, sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, through prototyping. Thank you. Back to you, Liana. Thank you, Mala. That was a very, very helpful retrospective and I think a great example of how you can go in with one design in mind and still really be able, need to be able to pivot to respond to um, the, what people want to see rather than what we think they want to see. And also thank you for the honesty in terms of speaking about, you know, the rise and maybe unfortunately the, the um, end or an end in Dolo360 for the moment. So thank you for sharing that with us. Let's go to our third speaker now. Our third speaker is Satvik Sethi. Satvik is a mental health activist and social entrepreneur on a journey to make the world happier. He is the founder and CEO at Runaway, a social venture that provides mental health support. Satvik won the Empower Award 2020 from Mental Health America and was featured on the 25 under 25 social entrepreneurs list by Impaction and Culture Media Co. Safik, over to you. Hey, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So my name is Safik Sethi. I'm a 22-year-old mental health activist, but my journey with mental health began all the way back when I was in middle school. It was a time when myself and a lot of my friends around me were going through mental health challenges, but obviously at the time, we didn't really know that these are mental health problems. But I always was someone who a lot of my friends felt comfortable talking to, reaching out to when they needed help. And slowly over time, I started learning more about mental health and kind of the impact that it can have on someone. And it wasn't until ninth grade when I lost one of my closest friends to suicide that I realized that, you know, this is devastating and I want to do more. So I started going online on platforms like Instagram and looking for strangers who were using the platform to reach out to find help. And in the past few years, I've spoken to over 450 strangers just going online, reaching out and being a friend to them. Um, when I came to college to the United States, I realized that it was a time when my own mental health was pretty bad because I was an international student, so just transitioning and coming into this new environment. But at the same time, I wanted to continue the work that I was doing with just helping people out with their mental health. So I came up with the idea to create Runaway because I was like, now there's an app for everything. Why not one for mental health? And what Runaway basically hopes to do, and we actually just started signups for our app, um, it's going to be an extensive mental health platform. So people could reach out and talk to our peer support volunteers one-on-one -on -one anonymously about their mental health, just like they would talk to me back in the day. We're also going to have a lot of mental health resources, blogs, education information, things of that sort. But in these past four years, besides developing Runaway, we posted a lot of events on college campuses. We've done a lot of research and work with organizations like UNICEF, like WHO, Mental Health America, to just work on more advocacy stuff because I've realized that mental health is not something that's linear and everyone has mental health and there's just so much stigma that is in the world when it comes to mental health. And I've just you know, done whatever we could to make it more transparent, make it more accessible and make it more affordable. Um, our team now, since the day we started, has grown to a team of about 150 student volunteers from around the world and um, it's been a really exciting journey to just kind of see how people are getting so invested in this space and how there's such a bright future ahead of us so just last year we gave out over 100 free virtual subscriptions to a virtual therapy platform and for me 
um, something that I've always kind of emphasized is that mental health in this whole ecosystem, I don't see anyone working in this space as competition. For me, we're all important stakeholders working towards the same goals of making the world happier. And so I've tried my best to kind of always reach out to different organizations, different influencers, different individuals working in this space to work together to bring resources. The cool part about my work is that we will be the first ever platform that's completely, completely free in every aspect for the users, whether it's our peer support, whether it's, you know, the resources that we have. And it's free because I genuinely never started run away to make money off of it or anything of that sort. I just wanted to help. It was something that I was doing in my free time and I just wanted to involve more people. And I'm really proud to say that today Runaways become like this global community. Our volunteers come from all around the world from very different backgrounds. We've all age groups going all the way from 14 years old to 45. Um, and it's just been a tremendous experience. And I'm hoping that with interventions and, you know, planning and frameworks like this, that youth engagement can continue to be a focus of tomorrow because we like youth is really the people who's driving our future and investments in us, our time, our energy, our efforts are going to pave the way for a brighter future. Thank you so much. And my social links are here. If you'd like to get in touch, talk about volunteer opportunities, or just learn more about my work, I'm always happy to chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Satvik. And you had a lot of compliments. You have some queries in the Q&A for you, compliments in the chat to both the work you're doing and your dog. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Our very final, um, our very final panelist before we move into the Q and A session is Neda Budiono. So Neda was named one of the 120 under 40 family planning leaders, and she works at the intersection of youth, health, and tech. Her expertise is in leveraging digital platforms to disseminate sexual and reproductive health information and scaling up demand for SRH services among youth. Currently, she works as a program associate for innovations in youth development at UNFPA Indonesia. Neda, over to you, take us home. Hi, hello everyone. Um, or as we say it in my native tongue, Bahasa Indonesia. Hello, selamat malam. Uh, I'm Nera, I'm from UNFPA Indonesia. I hope you can see this little uh, bubble thingy on my on my right and today I'm really really excited to um, share to you guys about one of our office's initiatives uh, which is the digital adolescent and youth reproductive health content creators community of practice uh, which I know is a, a mouthful so I usually just refer to it as the COP uh, and I'd like to start by saying something that I'm sure most of us already know, uh, which is that digital, digital spaces and content provide a crucial opportunity for young people to learn about reproductive health. The youth team at our office knows this already, and so we were kind of thinking of ways of making sure that um, these digital spaces are really filled with quality, relevant content that really reaches young people. And so what we did um, at first was we did ecosystem scanning. Uh, our goal was that we wanted to identify like who are the key players and who are content who are the content creators who are most active and the most influential in the digital SRH space. And we did so using social media listening, um, a lot of interviews, and also a lot of focus group discussions. And our ecosystem analysis actually revealed that there are already so many um, youth-led digital platforms, youth influencers, and et cetera, who have large numbers of reach and who have such incredible and creative content. And so we thought that the more strategic approach would be for us to harness this network and give support to, this, uh, to these uh, content creators instead of us rolling out a new app or a new website to create content um, ourselves. And this is uh, really because, sorry, Oh yeah, this is really because um, we believe that young people should take lead and they should have creative control over their contributions. Um, and we also wanted to position um, ourselves, UNFPA, as facilitators, enablers, and supporters really, that give assistance to these content creators um, to make their content creation process easier and to elevate their content and platform while still um, maintaining uh, the creator's creativity and authenticity. And so we thought that the COP or the community of practice would be a really great space to uh, make this happen. And so um, 
after uh, we did a lot of discussions and consultations, we also did a lot of um, baseline and needs assessment. Uh, we created the COP in June 2020, so we're actually still pretty young. Um, and uh, we were really aiming to improve exchange of resources, strengthen collaboration, and also build collective capacity. And I'll zoom in on this slide so that you, get, you can see. So UNFPA is supporting um, the COP in three main ways, really. The first one in the, the yellow highlight, uh, we're providing a knowledge management platform that pools and provides resources to inform content. And this includes curated key messages, references and tools for content, as well as data and situational analysis regarding young people's conditions and needs. And on the left, we also have the, uh, the one highlighted in purple, which is to link and facilitate collaboration between creators and resource persons and experts. And um, lastly, on the right, we have increasing capacity of these COP members in digital content creation, uh, management, and also health communications. So um, one, of, one example of a knowledge product that our country office uh, made with feedback from the COP, of course, is this consolidated list of youth-friendly key messages for COVID-19 uh, risk and response communications. And so we purposely made it as key messages because we found that it was really important for the creators to have the flexibility to adapt these messages into their style of content, reflecting their creativity and authenticity, and really just adjusting these key messages so that it fits with their target audience's uh, needs and aspirations. Uh, another example, um, oh, sorry. Another example is this uh, curated pool uh, or repository of youth-friendly references that these young content creators can access. Um, if they choose to, they don't have to go through the trouble of looking for valid references um, for, for them to use for their content. They can just go into our curated pool and they can just select any um, reference that they would like to use. And this curated pool of references is also linked to the key messages so that if they were to use a particular key message for their content, they will find the corresponding references for that key message as well. So it's one whole uh, package. And uh, another thing that we do is we conduct capacity building. So we have online workshops and seminars on Zoom uh, with experts. And I think what, what's unique about um, the capacity building that we provide is that we draw on insights from um, a variety of fields. Um, of course, uh, there's health and well-being because that is the general uh, theme of the community of practice, but we also do training on a lot of other topics, like for instance, digital safety and well-being. We also did one on data and how we can utilize data to improve content. We also learned about digital marketing strategies. Uh, we also even learned about critical appraisal of research so that whenever we want to use um, scientific evidence or research for our content, we know how to critically appraise it first. And uh, all of those things that I mentioned uh, are hosted on our Google site platform. So we have this Google site that these young content creators can just access. And this was really made uh, to enhance uh, user experience so that they can just find everything that they need um, for their content and for their platform in our Google site. Uh, and this is uh, kind of the COP at a glance. I can just show you and zoom in a little bit. So currently we have, we're still very young, so currently we only have 25 members. Uh, but I think I'm really happy because uh, the members represent a lot of different regions of Indonesia instead of it being concentrated just on a single island, um, which is uh, most often like the case for uh, Indonesia. And um, before I end, I think if there is one last key insight or action point that I can share to you is that let's not assume that we should add into the existing ecosystem. In my case, it was digital reproductive health content for young people because more often than not, young people are already doing an amazing job at filling the gap and filling and um, solving the problems that we're thinking about. Um, and this is actually the case for a lot of youth issues as well. And so uh, maybe the approach, the right approach would be for us to harness what's already there instead. And I think this approach is really empowering and it allows us to invest our resources in young people instead of um, maybe a new platform that we might not actually need that much. Um, yeah, and so I'm really, really happy that this is the approach and the road that we took with the COP. Uh, and I think that's all for me. Thank you so much for listening and for this opportunity. Back to you, Leanne.
Thank you so much, Naira. And thank you everyone um, for those fantastic lightning talk presentations. I know we asked you to tell us so much with a very, very uh, tough time constraint. You've all done brilliantly. I'm going to ask now if all of our panelists could turn on their video for the remaining 15 or so minutes we have. We've had a lot of questions coming in through the Q&A, some of which I know you've been typing answers to, um, and some of which might be nice for us to discuss together. I want to actually use Neda's last point that she made about not necessarily adding to the ecosystem as a bit of a, of a jumping off point here. We have a lot of attendees um, who are joining us who represent organizations of varying different sizes. Um, many of you are affiliated with organizations as well. Um, and we have two of our panelists who, F3 actually, four, all of you, all of you actually saw a gap and started your careers when you saw a gap and you filled it yourself. Um, and so I guess my question for you is, um, what, what is it that you could see organizations, whether it's inter intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, even donors do to um, support, identify and support um, people who are already in the space doing the work. I'm actually going to start off with Mala and see if Mala can give us a response because I know you've kind of come out on the other side where you created something and you know it had its natural cycle and now you're on the other side of that. When you think back on your experience, is there anything that you could have envisioned, could have brought some support? And then spoiler Sotvik, I'm coming to you afterwards for the same question. Yeah, thank you, Leanne, for that question. I think it's very valid in the sense that we still, unfortunately, um, pay a lot of lip service to youth engagement, to supporting um, youth-led initiatives, especially initiatives that are really grounded and informed by you know, the, the lived experiences and the realities of, of, of young people around the world. So I think to me, it's just pretty straightforward. Just start investing. Um, start investing and, yeah, you know, keep talking, but can we start investing? It's true that I, you know, I have moved on to the other side of the things and maybe I can see things a bit more clearly in terms of what the opportunities are and what the struggles are in terms of meeting young people where they are. But it's just plain straightforward as that. If we say we are supporting young initiatives, can we support them? Can we just stop saying we want to support them? Can we tone down on the 1,000 conferences a year? And can we start investing in youth-led initiatives? Thank you, Mala. Sadfik, over to you. Yeah, I completely echo Mala's point. I think like the lip service has to eventually come to a stop, and there needs to be time for action. You know, I see such amazing grassroots movements and organizations from different countries all the time. And, you know, their, their founders and whatever will be invited to speak at these events, but never actually get any funding or any support out of them. Um, and I think the problem for a lot of organizations is that they want to do real work and not worry about making money, but actually helping the communities. And, but most of the investors and organizations really want to put money where they can get a lot of their money back, which is really not how people first services operate, you know, like for runaway making money is never part of our ethos. It's not what we're working towards. And so from an investor point of view, yeah, we're not going to be a great investment, but that is what investment in mental health and investment in communities look like is for the good of people and not for the good of profit. And I think a lot more organizations and governments need to, be cognizant of that fact and realize that, you know, even if there's no profit, there is some great interventions happening and that in itself could be huge for their communities. Really, really great point. Um, Chris, I'm looking at you. Do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, so just to uh, reiterate what everybody said, just be like Nike and just do it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Also, I really feel like a lot of major organizations and government entities need to di diversify the hiring process and stop hiring people from similar backgrounds. Your staff needs to be just as diverse as the populations that you work with if you really want to do the work effectively. So really hiring people who have lived experience and not just the education to get the job done, but who have the capacity to do the work based off cultural and ethnic um, relations and backgrounds and settings. Brilliant, well put. Um, I want to pivot to a somewhat related question. Um, you know, we've talked about what it takes to support 
um, existing infrastructure that's in place. Now let's talk about engaging with young people when you're actually going through the process of developing an intervention. I know that something that we've discussed has been um, the, that part of the difficulty can say, you know, we have structures, NGOs, IGOs have structures to engage with communities, but at times, especially when you're dealing with populations that are under 18, you need to adapt some of these processes, structures, activities, and that can be a challenge. So I want to actually start this time with Chris and then maybe go to Naira as well to say, you know, is it, is it difficult? Is it difficult to adapt um, a process and a way of engaging or reaching out to a group of say 14 year olds, it, like how, how, how can you make it easy for organizations to just say, look, here's, here's how you engage meaningfully with young people. What's been your experience? So my mine goes back to staff development and hiring people. So hiring people who can not only just do the job, but hiring people who've done the job in the past, and hiring people who um, have already built relationships within the communities that you're working with. And then once you're engaging youth, uh, meeting them where they are, right? Using language common to them, meeting them in spaces that are common to them. Because because from my perspective, we're already talking about sex and sex can be taboo, especially when you're growing up and figuring out the world. So I'm figuring out my identity, I'm figuring out my what I like sexually and who I am, right? So that's tough, that's hard, and that's sometimes at times can be traumatic. So the worst thing for you to do is to come in and start talking to me in words and using language that I don't know and not taking time to really build rapport and trust with me, right? And also tokenize, tokenizing what I'm telling you and just taking it for granted and not giving me work, giving me credit when credit is due. Right. So for me, everything stems from hiring and really training the people that you have going out into the out into these communities in effective ways and partnering with people doing the work on a community level to really get the, the best bang for your buck, to really make these young people feel engaged and make them feel valuable a part of the process. A big gap in youth engagement is that we have youth, we engage youth, we know what to do, but when we get there, we can't keep them because we're not giving them the credit and they don't feel like they're valued. So understanding that we need to make youth feel valued as a part of the process. Thank you. That's very powerfully put. Neda. Yeah, I, uh, I do agree with everything Chris just said. And I'd also like to add maybe um, to do also a human-centered design or youth-centered design process with, with those populations that you're trying to engage in about how are the best ways to engage with uh, these populations. Because I think that the, the one who has answers on how best we can engage young people are young people themselves. So I would really encourage organizations to really put human-centered design and youth-centered design as a priority. And I think also uh, what's important is also using, for instance, like data collection method methodologies that are suitable for the population that you're working with. So for instance, you're working with like 14 year old uh, adolescents maybe who aren't uh, used to people asking them, okay, so what do you want? Or um, so what do you think is best for yourself? I think it's um, important for us to like adapt uh, our methodologies to uh, ones that will allow them to more freely express themselves, maybe through drawings or maybe through social media listening or maybe some other methodologies that would allow them to really speak um, their aspirations. Thank you for the suggestions of specific methodologies too. I think that's very, very helpful. Um, we've got a couple of questions. I know all of you have been in a position where you were the ones generating the content. And so one of the questions we got in the Q&A was, um, it was targeted to Mala, but I'm gonna expand it to whoever wants to answer. How did you, there's a question of how did you create demand? Because I will say this coming from, you know, the perspective of WHO, at times people who are developing these, uh, these interventions will, spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort putting them together and then aspire to have the kind of demand that some of your programming seems to have organically reached. So can, can any of you speak to that at all? I'll maybe hand it over to Mala first since I think the uh, question came for Indola 360 in particular, but anyone else who wants to answer after. Yeah, uh, thanks Leanne. So I think, so first of all, the basis is really grounding your content in evidence. So. You don't want to put myths out there and you know things that are not verified. So we really try to to ground uh, Indolo 360's uh, content in in evidence, so that young people are receiving the most relevant, up to date, uh, verified content uh, you know that exists. And now, with that said, um, Indolo 360 was quite an unprecedented move in Cameroon, and even when you look at it from a regional lens in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, it was unpre unprecedented um, in the sense that it was one of the first uh, to, be, to be developed. 
it is in English and in French, it had it came with a lot of innovation. And so the media, there was a lot of earned media around this. So we didn't really need to try too hard. Although, of course, could we have done more? Definitely. Um, but with the, you know, at the time and when it came out and uh, the interest from young people, we didn't have to do too much. Um, we had the media flocking to us. We had young people giving reviews, excited. Um, you know, recommending it to their friends and to their peers. And I think that is the energy that you want uh, to create around um, anything that has to do with young people's uh, sexual reproductive health and rights. It has to come from them. And when they feel included, and not just included, when they feel engaged as part of the process, then you don't need to, you know, work too hard to market it or to um, invest tons of money in marketing because that comes organically. Um, so yeah, we, we had a lot of earned media and, and uh, I'm very proud of how that, 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 that worked out. Yeah, so really organic reach. Sadvik, over to you, because I know you've seen, you talked a little bit about this kind of scaled growth you've seen on your end. Yeah, for, for me, it was really kind of almost in a way opposite where I realized that there is a demand, but no one that's fulfilling it. And, you know, I always say that a lot of people kind of, show off youth-led projects and youth-led innovations, but really, why are we doing it? You know, if the people that we have in power today are elected officials, organizations with the kind of funding, if they were doing what we as youth, the citizens of the world expected them to do, then we would have never had to intervene. You know, for us, it's not just something we're passionate about, but it is almost like giving your childhood away. You know, time when we should be out partying with her friends and like going to social events. I spent home working late at night to kind of get run away off the ground. But I did it because I realized that there was people who really, really needed a resource like that. I needed a resource like that. When I was 15 and felt all alone, my friends needed a resource like that. The strangers I spoke to needed something like that. And which is why when I was developing Runaway, it was just input from everywhere. And even now, you know, our signups are open and everything, but I still get messages on Runaway's Instagram account saying, hey, like, could you please talk to someone at our school because they don't take mental health seriously in the administration. And I was wondering if you could maybe just bring more exposure to mental health on our campus. Could you host an event here? You know, when is the app going to be at? And just really seeing how mental health problems, the stress, the trauma, it's all increasing every day. You know, the burden is not getting lower. And it's, in fact, the researchers have shown that younger kids now are getting mental health problems or getting diagnosed with mental health problems, but there just simply aren't enough resources. I've said it before at UN events, I've spoken at that because adolescents and, you know, people age between 13 to like 20 college student age is not a target demographic for any of the policies being created. And so there's a severe lack of interventions. We can't afford to pay a lot of money for things like therapy, even if it's online, it's still like sixty hundred dollars a month which we just can't afford. We also might not want to have those difficult conversations with our family. So who's going to help us? And which is why, like, I wanted to create this. And once I created it, once the word started getting out, whether it was at events like this or just word of mouth, which has been huge for us, people started really liking what we do and they're looking forward to this app being available as a resource for them. Thank you, Satvik. I'm keeping an eye on the time and see that we're down to about two minutes left of this webinar, which has flown by. I want to ask you all for your very last, very concise takeaway for our attendees. So if someone wants to leave this talk today with something in mind to be able to go out and in their own work, um, make sure that their next engagement with um, a young person is, as a special rapporteur said at the beginning, more authentic and sincere. What is one thing they could do? I'm going to ask you in the order in which you spoke. So, Chris, that means you're going first. Um, so the thing that comes to mind is that no longer can we think of youth engagement as a static process. It's dynamic. Um, so and when I say dynamic, I mean that youth engagement is well-rounded. It doesn't mean it passes to youth engagement. And once you start with youth, if, you, if it's for youth, you have to start with youth and end youth and make sure youth are in every piece and every portion of it. And no longer can we do traditional ways of youth engagement. Like you've seen here, we have people engaging youth on apps. But going into spaces and places where youth are, like using TikTok, using Instagram, right? Not just doing simple infographics and, and 
informational images, right? Maybe doing videos or doing uh, informational web series. So thinking of youth engagement as a dynamic process, but also allowing youth to come in and be a part of that process and make them feel valuable. Thank you, Chris. That's amazing. And I mean, you're hurting my heart. We made some pretty infographics for this launch. <laughs> okay, let me go over next to, to Mala, please. Your, your nugget, your quick takeaway. Quick takeaway. I would say, listen. And when you say you're listening to young people, are you really listening? Uh, not just listening to listen, but listening to act. Because when you ask anyone, it doesn't need to be young people. If you ask anyone, uh, their opinions on something, if you say you want to gather information about a certain issue, then you do have the responsibility to act on it. And so when we make um, all of these promises to young people and we say we want to listen to your voice and we want to listen to your needs, we should be taking the next step and acting on it. And I think um, I'm really grateful uh, to WHO and partners because who knows, maybe, I mean, back then we didn't have a framework guiding us. To, we just went organically with it. Who knows if we had something guiding us, if we could have, you know, been able to use that to, to better our processes, to, to improve what we were doing. So listen, don't, and don't, don't just listen to listen, listen to act. Listen to act, I love it. Um, Satvik, you're next. I think my fellow panelists kind of covered all the important takeaways. I would say that to anyone older listening, just know that since youth are the future, make sure to pass the mic to us and you know give us give us an opportunity to share our experiences and for a personal thing i would just like to tell everyone watching that it gets better so no matter where you are today in your journey no matter how big your problems may seem like one day it will get better so just keep pushing keep sticking through and you know there are brighter days ahead thank you Safik. and i think that's an especially important message now with everything going on nada you get the last word yes <laughs> Um, I think for me would be that uh, meaningful youth engagement and safeguarding young people's rights and well-being shouldn't be an afterthought to digital health solutions. It should be incorporated from the very beginning and in fact it really should be prioritized more than um, utilizing emerging new technologies or fancy new platforms. Thank you, Neda, and thank you all. Um, we are at the hour mark, so I want to give a big thank you to our panelists to Brianna, to the Special Rapporteur for her participation, our thanks to the IDP Network for hosting us um, on behalf of WHO, UNFPA, UNICEF, and UNESCO. And our thanks, of course, to the attendees um, who are watching this panel and those who will be watching it in the future. Um, and finally, the guidance will be um, uh, is, is available, it's online now, and a sincere thanks to the nearly 100 uh, people who were involved in its creation. So with that, please stay, stay safe, healthy, and sane um, it, now and in the coming months. And looking forward to seeing you when we see you next. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.